Within the private sector, you have old private sector players with maybe religious or philanthropic or other perspectives. What is new is the emergence of corporate or profit-making players in sectors which from the 1950s have been seen as a state's purview. The argument being made, and it's a very important argument, is is there going to be greater inequity with the emergence of these new corporate players? The answer to that depends on what the non-state player is doing. Is it a corporate player using primarily a profit-making objective, or is it a corporate player using a non-profit objective? Now, that again is easier in the context of countries that have strong legal and contractual structures. So you could imagine organizations, even large corporate players, having a corporate social responsibility function, which is non-profit and a profit function. In many countries in the developing world where the evolution, emergence of new private forms of delivery are relatively new, it's much more fungible. The, the boundaries are much more porous. Even what is state and non-state is not often clearly defined. So in that context, to impose a, a very strong straight jacket legal approach saying, well, where are you? is problematic. But what we need to do, if you want to understand the relationship between privatization and the public-private partnership, is to think through what are the kinds of public-private players. And there you want to classify religious, corporate, profit, non-profit. There isn't an immediate improvement in equity coming from public-private partnerships. Now, that may seem odd, because the data shows that the number of children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds has increased in private schools. But if we go across the deciles of the bottom third in society and disaggregate that increased enrollment of kids from poorer backgrounds, more deprived backgrounds, religious minority backgrounds, caste backgrounds, it's only the top third who have benefited. And the bottom third actually in relative terms have become less empowered. They have become disempowered because they see the top third in the poverty sector entering the private school and they cannot afford it either in economic terms or because they do not have the social capital to get the information of how to get into these private schools or they do not have the political clout to ensure their voice is heard in this system. So equity has not increased across groups in poverty in relation to public-private partnerships. But if you look at the big distinctions of the rich and poor in society, divide society into that simple division, then the bottom end of the poor have not benefited, but the top end of the poor are more like the middle class. So there is a social mobility feature that we see. The argument of PPPs in developing countries has tended to be demand-led. Um, it's the demand side that is going to make the supply side improve. So the argument being made is we will push for private schools, we'll bring them in, but really it's the ability of the poorer sectors in society to access this schooling, and so through demand instruments such as conditional crash transfers or vouchers, they'll be able to access this. They are first-generation learner families. The parents don't know what a PTA is meant for. So you've got the instruments for competition, but you don't have players who are fully conversant with what the process is. So then we asked them about the school management committees, because under the legislation that's brought in new providers, you also have the school management committee, which is on the supply side. Now here it's really interesting. Private schools want to keep out parents from SMCs if they ask too many questions. So they say, for example, we'd rather have women rather than men, because they're more quiescent in, in rural, quiet environments. Um, they also have SMCs where they select parents, so either of kids who are doing better, but often in, 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 in rural communities, parents who have social networks or kinship networks with them, so that they would be more agreeable. They would acquiesce to what the school did. So we don't see the demand side pulling the supply side up. We actually see the supply side controlling the demand side.